Ms. Power, you're uh, welcome to uh, start your testimony. If you have family or friends here, you're, please uh, feel free to introduce them. We understand this is a commitment not only of yourself but family, and we appreciate that. Uh, your full statement will be entered into the record without objection, uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Ranking Member Corker and distinguished members of this committee. It is a great honor uh, to appear before you as President Obama's nominee to serve as the U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations. Representing the United States would be the privilege of a lifetime. I'm grateful to the President for pr placing his trust in me. I would like to thank my friends and my remarkable family, uh, my parents who brought me here from Ireland, Vera Delaney and Edmund Burke, my husband, Cass Sunstein, and our children, four-year-old Declan, and one-year-old Rian, who has already proven less interested in this hearing than others here today. I would also like to thank Senator Chambliss and Senator Isaacson for their generous, remarkable introductions. Growing up as an Irish immigrant in Atlanta, Georgia, I can't say that the UN was a popular topic with my classmates at Lakeside High School. Uh, but it was in Georgia, while working at this same local television station, that I witnessed foot footage of the massacre uh, in Tiananmen Square and resolved then that I would do what I could for the rest of my life to stand up for American values and to stand up for freedom. My Georgia friends supported me every step of the way, and I'm so proud now to count these two great public servants, Senator Isaacson and Senator Chambliss, among them. When I first came to this country, I viewed the United Nations as a place where people assembled to resolve their differences. It was the stage, as Senator Corker said, on which iconic Americans like Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Jean Kirkpatrick stood up for what was right. Unfortunately, when I traveled to the Balkans in 1993, I saw a different side to the UN. UN peacekeepers had been sent to protect civilians, but in the town of Srebrenica, more than 8,000 Muslim men and boys were executed in cold blood as the peacekeepers stood idly by. The UN is, of course, multifaceted, and its record mixed. It was with the support of the UN that I traveled in 2004 to Darfur, where I discovered a mass grave and many charred villages, hallmarks of the genocide being carried out by the Sudanese government. Today, it is the World Health Organization that is helping to provide polio vaccinations, even as terrorists wage an assassination campaign against doctors. And last Friday, it was the UN that provided a stage for Malala, the brave young Pakistani girl who was shot last year by the Taliban on her way home from school. Together, she and the UN will inspire millions to stand up for girls' education. Yet alongside all of this within the UN, an organization built in part to apply the lessons of the Holocaust, we also see unacceptable attacks against the State of Israel. We see the absurdity of Iran chairing the UN Conference on Disarmament. We see the failure of the UN Security Council to respond to the slaughter in Syria a disgrace that history will judge harshly. What is also clear 68 years after the United Nations was founded in San Francisco is that an effective UN depends on effective American leadership. The war in Bosnia didn't end because the UN acted. It ended because President Clinton, backed by a bipartisan coalition in Congress, including Senator McCain, took robust action. It is now possible to imagine an AIDS-free generation in Africa not merely because of the essential work of UN AIDS, but because President George W. Bush decided to provide life-saving drugs on a massive scale. I believe that America cannot, indeed I know that America should not, police every crisis or shelter every refugee. While our goodwill knows no bounds, our resources are of course finite, strained by pressing needs at home, and we are not the world's policemen. We must make choices based on the best interests of the American people and other countries must share the costs and burdens of addressing global problems. There are challenges that cross borders that the United States alone cannot meet. There are cases, as with sanctions against Iran and North Korea, where U.S. efforts pack far more punch when we are joined by others. There are occasions, as in Mali today, when the U.N. has to step up to prevent state failure, which abets terrorism. An effective U.N. is critical to a range of U.S. interests. Let me highlight quickly, three key priorities that I would take up if confirmed by this Senate. First, the UN must be fair. The United States has no greater friend in the world than the State of Israel. We share security interests, we share core values, and we have a special relationship with Israel. And yet, the General Assembly and Human Rights Council continue to pass one-sided resolutions condemning Israel. 
Israel, not Iran, not Sudan, not North Korea, is the one country with a fixed place on the Human Rights Council's agenda. Israel's legitimacy should be beyond dispute, and its security must be beyond doubt. And just as I have done as President Obama's UN advisor at the White House, I will stand up for Israel and work tirelessly to defend it. Second, the UN must become more efficient and effective. In these difficult budget times, when the American people are cutting back, the UN must do the same. This means eliminating waste, strengthening whistleblower protections, ending any tolerance for corruption, and getting other countries to pay their fair share. It means closing down those missions and programs that no longer make sense. The United States has the right and the duty to insist on reform, and if confirmed, I will aggressively pursue this cause. Third, the UN must stand up for human rights and human dignity, which are American values and universal values. Today, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is widely hailed and yet only selectively heeded. Taking up the cause of freedom is not just the right thing to do, it is, of course, the smart thing to do. Countries that violate the rights of women and girls will never approach their full potential. Countries that don't protect religious freedom create cleavages that destabilize whole regions. If I am given the honor of sitting behind the sign that says, United States, I will do what America does best, stand up against repressive regimes and promote human rights. I will also do everything in my power to get others to do the same. This means contesting the crackdown on civil society being carried out in countries like Cuba, Iran, Russia, and Venezuela. It means calling on the world to unite against human trafficking and against the grotesque atrocities being carried out by the Assad regime. And it means uniting peoples who long to live free of fear in the cause of fighting terrorism. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Corker, and other distinguished members of the committee, the late ambassador, my friend Richard Holbrook, told this committee that Congress should be in on the takeoffs, not just the landings. I appear before you today not just to seek your support, but to ask to join you in a conversation about how to strengthen what is right and fix what is wrong at the UN. If I am confirmed, I will continue this dialogue directly and personally. And if the prospect of visiting the UN doesn't immediately entice you, my son Declan has resolved to become a tour guide like no other. If I am given the privilege of sitting behind America's placard, behind the United States of America, you will be able to count on me. I will fight fiercely every day for what is in the best interests of the United States and of the American people. I will be a blunt, outspoken champion of American values and human rights. I will be accessible and forthright in my dialogue with you. And above all, I will serve as a proud American, amazed that yet again, this country has provided an immigrant with such an opportunity, here the ultimate privilege of representing the United States and fighting for American values at the United Nations. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Well, thank you very much for your statement. Uh, we'll start a round of questioning, and I, and I would just say that following Declan uh, at the UN, I would not get lost because I would see that red hair no matter what. So, uh, and he's being very well behaved, the fact that this is boring. So, uh, the day is young. <laughs> We've got a lot of rooms here. So uh, let me uh, start off. Uh, I appreciate your statement on Israel, uh, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, you know, above and beyond fighting battles to de those who seek to delegitimize Israel, uh, the U.S. has been very helpful in promoting Israel's position at the United Nations. Um, as you know, Israel is seeking to represent the Western Europe and other groups on the Security Council in 2018, representing the first time that Israel would serve at the pinnacle of the U.N. system. Uh, do you know if we're working to promote Israel for the Security Council, uh, and how can we work in that regard as well as um, the other injustice that Israel faces in the UN system is that in Geneva, uh, unlike in New York, Israel is not part of any regional grouping. So uh, would you uh, commit to the committee that you will make efforts, should you be confirmed, to have Israel among the family of nations have an opportunity just like any other country would? Absolutely, sir. Excuse me. Absolutely, sir. Um, I did speak in my opening remarks about fighting delegitimation, but what's a critical complement to that is legitimation. 
we have had modest success, I think, working with our Israeli friends uh, to secure leadership positions across the UN system, such as the Vice Presidency of the General Assembly several years back, uh, some leadership roles in UN Habitat and other organizations, membership in, in WIOG and participation in WIOG in New York. Um, but you're right, the Security Council seat is one uh, that has eluded Israel uh, despite its many contributions uh, across the years. And I, I commit to you wholeheartedly uh, to go on offense as well as playing defense uh, on the legitimation of Israel and uh, will make every effort to secure greater integration of Israeli public servants in the UN system.